and for it, periods of months on end. But it wasn't. So it wasn't. It wasn't. And not only that, Gone. what 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 caught my attention finally was when I looked down at the bottom of the page of the briefing document. Here I am in June of 1997, and at the bottom of the page it says September 1992. So I asked. I said, "What is this all about here? You're you're." You finished your analysis some five years ago, yeah. uh, and why aren't you uh, making this public? And they hemmed and hawed, and finally someone said, well, we were waiting for the Chernobyl findings to come in on thyroid cancers. And so um, what I did is that I, since I was working for the Secretary of Energy, I wrote a memorandum to the Secretary and basically I urged that that would this this document be released immediately, and that um, there was no need to to sort of wait for uh, for people to drop dead from Chernobyl. That you could do some reasonable estimates, and I estimated at that time that the median estimate of thyroid cancers there would be at least seventy five thousand excess thyroid cancers. From where? Uh, yeah, and, where? and for from my where? Trouble, from Chernobyl. From no, no, just from oh, the fallout from okay. the Nevada test. Yeah, yeah. So um, it finally came out. Uh, the head of the National Cancer Institute had to admit before a congressional invest, uh, hearing that indeed they had suppressed the study. The people who had conducted the study had transferred over from the U.S. Nuclear Weapons Program before that to do it, uh, which gives you an idea yeah. of sort of the reach of, of this industry. In our in our society here in the United States, and the principal investigator, of course, was demoted, and you know people left, and that was the end of that. But uh, it indicated to me just what a fundamental conflict of interest we have in in with governments that have made such huge investments in nuclear technology that they 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 have created a system uh, that. Where the 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 people who are, who are responsible for putting people in harm's way are responsible for uh, uh, for explaining why they did it and what what might have happened, and that creates in, in, uh, immediate conflicts of interest and corruption of science and medicine and all the things that are important to a healthy society. I'm interviewing Bob Alvarez, who served as a senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment. So, Bob, okay, here's the next question. I'm a physician, and I guess in a certain sense, in my mind, I represent my colleagues and my profession. We're the ones that deal with people who walk in with a lump in their neck uh, and we diagnose thyroid cancer and we have to take it out and excise the whole thyroid and help the patients to die, and I've helped patients to die of thyroid cancer, and it's a hideous, horrible death. I remember one woman, aged 28, who was my patient when I was actually an intern, aged 23, at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and she came in with thyroid cancer. It had disseminated to a degree in her body. She was a ballet dancer. And she gradually died uh, as the secondaries got into her brain. She became incontinent of urine and feces and started to lose her equilibrium mentally and the like. And it was the most debilitating, horrific, painful death. And almost certainly we postulate that that thyroid cancer was caused by radioactive iodine released from the British tests at Maralinga um, north of Adelaide, um, and what happened was they blew a, up a huge bomb and the wind changed, and they didn't expect that to happen, and Adelaide was absolutely dust in radioactive fallout. So my question to you, Bob, is, and you may not be able to answer it, why is not the medical profession of attacking this... Uh, what can I say? Revolting industry, which is killing people. Well, I think I think the practice of medicine, at least in the United States, has become so compartmentalized that uh, you know, if you you even go to a radiologist who knows about radiation, um, 
they they can't give you any straight answers about well what kind of dose might I receive yes, that's if I take true. procedure and why aren't you recording this in my chart well yeah. they're not they don't have to um, there and that I think medicine has become as I said has become so fragmented and and uh, uh, so highly specialized that people sort of when when this happens when you have this kind of specialization uh, I think what happens is that the the, the 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 knowledge of the bigger picture of what might be happening to the society as a whole and what and the role of physicians in dealing with that tends to get lost in the shuffle. And no one takes and responsibility. We, but you, and we have to, and, we, and then we have to depend on, on people. And I, there's no problem. I have no problem with this. But we have to really depend more and more on, on doctors and professionals who look at large populations as if they were patients. Hmm. And these are people that are commonly known as epidemiologists. Hmm. Uh, and the problem is that. Uh, our tools to measure a lot of these these effects are not uh, are not uh, accurate enough and sharp enough to pick up a lot of things that we should. And the science itself, I mean, in the United States, until well into the uh, the 1990s, the the new U.S. nuclear weapons con- program had monopoly control over all radiation health effects research because they considered uh, the loss of that control to be a threat to the national security of the United States. Is that so? And and did that influence the World Health Organization as well? I don't know if it's influenced the World Health Organization, but it certainly influenced how the United States did its own research I had through no the idea. National Cancer Institute and elsewhere. I had no and it was idea through, about that. So uh, this this sort of uh, this is a form of corruption of science and medicine when you when you allow this to happen. But you know, at the end of World War II, nuclear weapons were held with such awe and fear, and and were considered uh, so essential to. Uh, preserving the national security or protecting the national security that uh, things like uh, revealing the, revealing information that clearly indicated that you were putting workers in harm's way or the public in harm's way were considered national security threat yeah well, I mean you know, I, I, I recall go on I recall in 19 in the 1980s uh, during the first mm-hmm. Reagan administration the uh, uh, the general counsel, uh, chief lawyer of the Defense Department, sending a letter to Congress d- declaring that providing compensation to military personnel who may have been made ill from exposure to radiation during open air testing was a threat to our national security. Oh my God! Well, just that was the, that's, it's just a mindset, and that that washes over into uh, uh, in, into the uh, into the way. Doctors are are uh, are educated, and science and, and the scientific agendas in terms of public health well, are determined. Yeah, I would disagree with that. I've just done grand rounds um, at a major ho- Johns Hopkins hospital in uh, in uh, St. Pete in Florida, and at the General Hospital in Tampa. And certainly, doctors don't have that attitude. But on the other hand, we are not taught in medical school about the effects of radiation and the isotopes produced in reactors and from bomb explosions and the like. In other words, we're pretty uneducated. But I will say right now, the American uh, Medical Association has just released a paper saying that we must all be concerned about radiological accidents. And I guess that was um, stimulated by the Fukushima accident. It's really quite in-depth. And there's another paper that's just come out too about a 10 kiloton bomb dropping on a city and what that would mean medically speaking to people and how we could cope well, with that as a medical. This profession. is encouraging. I mean, this is encouraging, but I think this is this is an example of what it means to end the Cold War and for the status of nuclear weapons to steady, steadily decline in this country. Mm. Is that we have we do have a more opening up. 
uh, and a broader understanding by people who, who uh, whose responsibility it is is to yeah, but it's uh, a, is to keep us healthy and to protect our, oh, our, it's a bit our lazy. health. It's a bit late, and when I look at the intricacies uh, involved in the nuclear power program, which is backed by the weapons program still in America, as you've so aptly described today, Bob Alvarez, and in Japan, it takes my breath away, and I just I, I, I I'm almost beyond trying to understand what these characters think they're up to. Um, I think that what's happening in Japan is one of the greatest evils imposed upon a, a, an unsuspecting, innocent society who in the past has suffered from the effects of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's just almost beyond belief. And the fact that the media is totally not attending to it um, is is something that must be taken on by all of us. You know, Bob, we've run out of time, and I'm terribly sorry. I've just been soliloquizing a bit, but um, you are a font of most extraordinary information, and the more you talk, the more fascinating it becomes because of your experience in the Department of Energy, um, which you once called the Department of Evil, to be actually... <laughs> Evil and entropy. Evil and <laughs> entropy, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. thank you so much, Bob. You're a, you're a national treasure, if not an international treasure. Well, thank you. Bye, Bob. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Robert Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he is currently focused on nuclear disarmament, environmental and energy policies. Thanks for listening today. You can go to our website at ifyoulovethisplanet.org to hear more programs and also to contribute to our funding if you would like to do so, which would help us enormously to continue doing this very important work. Thanks for listening and we'll be back with you next week with another very interesting program. I can promise you that. Bye for now.